thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm David Temple. I'm the president of the Historical Society. Uh, and can everybody hear me? OK. Uh, this is our first program for 2013-14. This is about the grist mill. We're going to start with Andrea Cronin, who is a member of our board, uh, who is going to give a brief history of the grist mill before uh, Dick Judge uh, became involved with it. And Dick has been, had been uh, leading the restoration efforts uh, for, over the last couple of years. And Dick will, has most of this presentation. Uh, can I see a, a show of hands of everybody who people who did not receive the uh, newsletter that we just mailed out last week. Did everybody get it? Okay, this is great. All these dues payers in the room. <laughs> uh, that's, that is a souvenir issue. That's the last print newsletter we're gonna send out. Uh, we're, we're emailing them. Uh, we've been using, sending out the portal by email monthly for the last couple of years. It's a, it's a better uh, publication, it's more timely. Uh, it's more detailed, uh, and it, uh, it saves us several hundred dollars a year versus uh, the uh, mailing the print one out. However, there are people who I know who don't have email, and we will, what we'll continue to do for members who don't have email is to print, a, print copies of the portal out and mail them. So I've got a sign-up sheet here if, any, uh, if there are any people who need to... Uh, sign up for it. Also, I have a, a separate sign-up sheet for people who want to get on the email uh, list for the, the portal. Has everybody seen the portal? Okay. If you've, if you've got it, you don't, don't need to sign, sign it, but uh, I, see, I see one person here who I think will want to, want to get it mailed. Um, okay. Uh, we, have four new, we have four new board members for the, for the society, and uh, they're they're all, they're all here. Michelle Linnert and uh, Garland Kincaid uh, and Susan Geller and where's the four? Oh, Teresa Knapp, yes. <laughs> well, I didn't see you come in. Can you, can you stand for a second just so people know who you are? <laughs> um, If by the way, if there's anybody here who, has, uh, who might at some point in the future be interested in joining the board when we have an opening, I'd, I'd love to hear from you because we do get openings periodically. We've we got four new, new people now, um, and it's nice to have know who's interested uh, in the future. Um, so, something I had intended to talk about, uh, but I forgot the book, but fortunately, George Gray walked in the door, and he re seeing him reminded me of this terrific uh, uh, thing we, George and I went to uh, in uh, the Dedham Courthouse a, f uh, a few days ago. Do you want to talk about this thing for a minute? About six years ago, a fellow from Dover, Jim Tedesco, and his son decided to put together a book, a postcard book of the 28 towns in Norfolk County. They asked each historical society to submit 10 postcards and write a history of the town in the postcards. It took them six years to do it. Unfortunately, his son, age 35, had a heart attack and died at the beginning of the project. So his parents continued the project, just finished it, and they had a book signing last Friday night at the uh, courthouse at the Indeta. Uh, a copy of the book was given to each town that submitted information, all 28 submitted. And this is you can take a look at it at the, the, at the end. They've done a beautiful job. It's a quality book, and there's a nice history of each one of the towns. And uh, David has a copy for yeah. the Medfield History yeah. Society. This is very clearly a, a labor of love. At, uh, at $30 a copy, he's not beginning to recover his cost. But uh, he, uh, he, Paul and his son, uh, the son conceived of the idea. Paul said, this is great. Let's do it. And he's carried it on. Um, and it, it's a, it's a terrific. Yeah. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> next month, uh, we have the inimitable Bill Mann, who's going to be our speaker here. Uh, and I, have, uh, he, he, I expect will regale us with uh, a, a lot of stories about 
his 30 years as a Medfield police officer and chief. Uh, personally, my, my favorite Bill Mann memory is the picture that appeared in the, uh, in the paper about 20 years ago with a Bill, Bill grinning from ear to ear as he held up two huge marijuana plants that he had pulled out of <laughs> <laughs> around the Charles River. <laughs> and I, I imagine, if we could find the picture, I'll try to, try to bring it. But uh, you've, you've heard Bill talk. Uh, he is uh, one of a kind, and uh, I, I hope you'll come and hear, hear him. We also have the uh, Peak House Pantry Sale coming up. That's uh, the Saturday before Thanksgiving each year. Uh, we'll ha have uh, the, the, the big cheese there, uh, uh, Mike Stamer. And uh, we'll be selling food and uh, some uh, recovered treasures on, at the uh, White Elephant uh, sale. The, the other thing is that we have a members only uh, holiday party coming up in uh, uh, early December. It's uh, the 8th, it's a Sunday, uh, and it's at the uh, Granville Mitchell House. This is a, this is a wonderful uh, shingle house opposite the uh, police station on North Street, it's a 111 North Street. You've probably driven by it a hundred times, but uh, it, it's, it's a fabulous house. Uh, I've always wanted to go in it, and uh, Doug and uh, uh, Meredith uh, Teeny have opened the house to us, and there'll be more announcements of that, of course. Uh, now I think I will turn it over to Andrea. Hello, ladies and gents. Um, good evening to you all. Thank you for coming out to hear about the Kingsbury Grist Mill. I'm largely going to talk about the, the history of the property um, and a lot about malt, but that's my own thing. Um, <laughs> all the research was done by uh, Cheryl O'Malley, and I am not taking credit for any of it. I'm just the presenter. Um, but I'm going to tell you about fire, inheritance, and malt. And malt is my favorite part, because clearly I'm a foodie. Um, <laughs> but yes, so they're not necessarily in that order. And there's a lot less arson than I planned, so don't get your hopes up. Um, however, if I were to start with the property, I would start with malt. The property actually um, had been producing malt for over 200 years, two centuries, which is pretty impressive. Um, if you know nothing about malt, I honestly think that it belongs in chocolate milkshakes, but actually it's the product of the fermentation process of barley, and it's used in brewing. <laughs> so that might interest you all, or keep you interested for a little bit. Um, basically, barley is harvested, and then it's um, soaked in either steeping pits or cisterns until it's softened. They drain it, and then they take the grains and they put it into another vessel that's called a couch. And uh, if you come to think of it, I think most fermentation happens on couches. But, uh, <laughs> but um, after that process, um, the barley decomposes, and then uh, it produces heat, which causes germ uh, it to germinate. Um, then the barley is taken and put on a flat floor malt house. Um, in this process, they um, let the sprouts grow to a certain size, and then they, um, the malters would use it to, um, they would actually kiln dry the entire um, lot of it. Then they would store it and, uh, well actually sift it, then they would store it, and then they would let it cultivate its flavor for a couple months. Um, it would be sold to brewers to use in yeast production and to brew beer. Um, so that is the most interesting thing about malt, what it becomes. <laughs> I'll still get your attention, right? <laughs> um, anyway, that's the basic process of malting. And what does that have to do with Kingsbury? So the property can actually trace its roots back to the beginning of Medfield, to the 13 original settlers. Um, and I always in my head sing 13 original colonies, but just might be second grade talking to me there. Um, basically, um, what was it? Joseph Clark and James Allen, two of the original 13 settlers, um, gave property to Joseph Clark Jr. 
Um, he basically, in 1663, he um, married Mary Ellen. That was his connection to James Allen, uh, Mary Allen. Um, and he uh, inherited property, well, his father essentially gave him property, which was at the intersection of Curve and Spring Street. Um, there he built a homestead and he also built a malt house. Um, he actually called the malt house Pine Swamp, which I think is very aptly named if you consider the property. Um, it was then that his father-in-law, James Allen, actually passed away in 1676. Um, this was right about the time of uh, the Native American um, colonist conflict, King Philip's War. And actually, James Allen's house burnt in that conflict. Um, we all know February 21st, 1676. Um, so what happened there was actually Joseph Clark Jr. lived until 1702, and he actually gave his property to his son, who was Captain Joseph Clark. Um, the captain had married Mary Wright and had six children. He actually lived on the north side of town, and when he inherited this property, um, an operational malt house on the south side, he moved right down there. Um, and basically, he was a, a cordwainer, which as far as I can tell is the fancy Anglicization of the French word cordonnier, which means shoemaker. But I'm not really sure how many shoes he made because um, he did a lot of um, work with the property. So I can't account for, you know, you know the saying like the cobbler's children go without shoes. I'm not really sure about the captain's children's footwear, but um, what the captain did to the property essentially was he, um, spent a lot of time improving it. He built the grist mill, and he also created a mill pond out of a meadow. And that's got to take time. I don't know how many shoes were being made, to be honest. Um, his youngest son was Thomas. And Thomas inherited the property, the grist mill, and the malt house. And it was actually Thomas who carried on this sizable um, malt operation. Um, if you'd been around in the 1720s, you would want to know Thomas, because he would give you the malt to make your brews. Um, it, was also, it was also under Thomas that the malting process I described earlier occurred. But in the later 1800s, they created this new process of um, malting, which they called pneumatic malting which kind of sounds like a disease to me. Um, but they no longer needed the flat-floored malting houses. Um, and it, just before the coming of the American Revolution, Thomas decided to will his property to his daughter's husband. His name was Asa Hammond. Um, and this was in 1774. Within two years, Thomas would pass away, 1776. Um, but Asa Hammond took over the property. Um, in the deed, it, was, uh, it included the house, the barn, the grist mill, the malt house, and other structures on the property. Um, Benjamin Franklin wrote in 1789 uh, in a letter, our new constitution is now established and has the appearance that promises permanency, but in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except for death and taxes. Um, which is interesting because in Asa's time, uh, a miller was granted 1 16th of the grain as part payment for grinding, which was called a toll, which sounds to me like a tax, and I like to call it a grinder's fee. Um, but Hammond's son, Charles, inherited the property. He had married Zilpa Turner in 1807, and the house that actually stands today, um, he built in 1805. Um, his nephew, Clark Smith, came to live with Charles and Zilpa, um, when the boy's father, Titus Smith, died. The boy had been about 10 years old at the time. Um, and Clark Smith was the one to inherit the property. The mill pond became known as Clark Smith's Pond, and basically the locals used it for skating, fishing, and bathing, which isn't much different than today, except for the fact that I think the Medfield police would have something to say about it if you were bathing there. 
Um, Clark, <laughs> Clark Smith married Caroline Morse in 1821. Um, their daughter was Oliver, who married George W. Kingsbury. And that is where the Kingsbury name comes to the property. Um, it actually stayed within the Kingsbury family until the passing of Blanche Kingsbury in, 18, no, in 1987. Um, and then in 1989, the town of Medfield brought, bought the mill and the property for 300000 And ever since then, it's been being restored by the Kingsbury Pond Committee, about which I'm sure Dick Judge will have a lot to say. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so where do I take off after, after that uh, fine introduction, besides tripping on myself? Uh, so uh, very steeped in Medfield history, the grist mill is. Um, hundreds of uh, residents, or I would say 98% of the residents of Medfield have never been in the building. Uh, it's more fascinating on the inside than it is on the outside. Uh, the timbers are hand-hewn. The whole building is put together with, uh, with wooden pegs. And it's uh, your, uh, oh, <laughs> it's judge, the password. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and so the, uh, the, uh, the building uh, fascinated me. I, I was a selectman down at Sandwich uh, for years. And we had an operating grist mill in Sandwich. It was the crown, uh, uh, jewel in the crown uh, of the town. And when I ever found out that this was a grist mill, this little red building sitting off to the side, um, I immediately became interested and started to try to chase down someone who knew something about it. Um, I called the phone number on the sign. Uh, it was the town hall. They didn't know anything about it. Uh, they knew that there was a committee at one time that had been, uh, that, that had, uh, had disbanded. Um, and so I was able to chase down uh, Mike Cronin originally. Uh, and he was uh, a huge help. Uh, he basically uh, uh, turned the project over to me and said, good luck. No, he was, <laughs> no. Uh, Mike was great. He gave me the history, the, uh, what, the, what the original committee had accomplished. Um, where they were intending to go, uh, and, and where they've been. And if you have a chance to look at some of the photos of the original committee at work, uh, they did the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the major part of the reconstruction of this mill. If it weren't for that original committee, uh, we wouldn't have the mill here today uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the pond would have taken it out and washed it out because they had uh, repaired and taken care of the sluiceway leading into the mill. So there is a, a waterfall inside the mill. Most people don't know that. When you go inside and go down below and see the water falling inside, it's, it's fascinating. That water was being held back by nothing. And so the original committee uh, basically shored up everything inside the mill and made it uh, a, a, a wonderful, uh, sturdy building to, to, for us to be able to uh, dig into and, and, and uh, get going on. So I'll make a long story short. The uh, passing by the mill many times, many times, finding out what it was, uh, talking to neighbors, and they're, they're, they're expressing interest in, in maybe getting involved, uh, opening up the mill and finding a half inch of dust on the floor. Uh, Blowing out the mill, we, we put some industrial fans in the back doors of the mill and came in the front door with a, with a, uh, 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 a leaf blower. <laughs> and I called the fire department and the police department and let them know that the mill was not going to be on fire, but we were going to be uh, blowing out all the dust. And when I tell you there were four phone calls <laughs> reporting that the mill was on fire, yeah. So any, anyhow, uh, after we blew it out, we were able to organize everything inside and find out what was there and what wasn't there. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of it is still there. Surprisingly, after all the years of, of uh, people uh, breaking in, 
uh, the graffiti, the graffiti inside, and so forth. Uh, we have graffiti from 1942, from 1956. From it, it's etched. Everybody decided to uh, carve their name, uh, including some youngsters in Medfield. Uh, Barbara Layton's name is there. <laughs> uh, carved in in uh, in stone and in in wood. Um, so. Just want to touch ba touch one more time on the the original committee. Uh, the the mill would not exist without the original committee, uh, with Mike Cronin and Barbara Layton and all the other folks that 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 uh, put uh, tons of time into uh, replacing main beams that are this big, um, re uh, cleaning out the sluice way where the water could flow through, uh, uh, laying brick. Barbara uh, laid all the bricks on the on the uh, at the base of the, uh, at the uh, of the mill inside the mill. So, getting that kind of an education very quickly, and then realizing that uh, the mill, we can actually bring this back to life. So, uh, it's it would be a modernization of a 300-year-old facility, uh, but it would be bringing it back to its original condition or original history. Uh, I was very excited to hear that um, a lot of beer and hops was made on, on the site. Uh, I've already uh, gotten commitments from uh, uh, Blue Moon for any flour that we produce there. Uh, evidently, there is a difference between stone ground flour and the ground flour that we have today. He, he swears that, that it's quite a difference. Um, uh, I've gotten commitments from local, uh, local home brewers that they would buy every bit of hops and barley that we were able to produce as well. So uh, getting the mill going again, what kind of commitment did that take? Uh, it, basically, uh, you have to be certifiable because when you walk into the mill, uh, you, you see things just hanging and, 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 and in, uh, dusted and in the corner. Um, so the vision uh, came from not only myself, but other, uh, other people that just jumped into the process. People who were coming, driving by, saw the door open, wanted to see the inside of the mill. Uh, uh, and and uh, that spread into uh, the to tours for the uh, third graders. It's now part of the tour uh, the third graders take. Uh, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, uh, people just started flooding in. It was, it was great. Um, and has been great. And one of my pitches tonight is uh, contributions, not, not necessarily of money, but of time or materials. And if you have time to educate other people about what you know about the mill or materials, what we, uh, the plan for the mill is a museum, an operating museum. Uh, when I was down in Sandwich at the Glass Museum, they spent uh, $600,000 to turn the museum into an operating museum because that's the, new, the way museums are going now. They want, people want to see actively, and we have it already. It's right there. So all we need to do is bring, uh, what we're looking for is farm implements, uh, a piece of history of Medfield um, that you, you, you may, may, people may find interesting. Um, and we're going to, uh, there is a, well, let me talk about the wheel because we're going to pull a turbine out of one side of the building and there's a room uh, about half the size of this room to use for uh, a museum. The other side of the building uh, will, will be the operating side and uh, the stones are still there. Uh, the gears, half of them are missing underneath but we, there's a, uh, uh, I just learned uh, in Milford there is a, uh, the top gear manufacturer in the world is in, right in Milford. I walked into their warehouse, I drove, I drove by and I said, you know what, gear, gears and, and, uh, and sprockets. I pulled in, I went around the back, and the warehouse is full of the gears that we need. I mean, every shape, size, whatever. So uh, those folks are willing to contribute uh, to the project. Um, and so, like so many others, that all, all I need to do is, or anybody do is ask, and most people are fascinated and want to get involved. Um, so what we're doing is bringing back, we're, you know, back to the future. This is back to the history, um, what we're doing. Uh, it originally, 
uh, was set up um, with a, a wood water wheel. Uh, we know that now because, uh, Garrett, can you grab that stone for me? Um, uh, a, a stone was found in the, in, the, in the sluice underneath where everything was produced. Thanks. And this is quite heavy, but this is a bearing. This is where the shaft of the original wheel went into. There were two of these, they were a pair, and you can tell that's, that's a lot of years of, of a wheel turning on, on, this, on this stone bearing. This is the only thing that's left the, of, uh, because it's stone, all the wood has been long time rotted and, and, and gone. So we're, we're fortunate to have uh, some pieces of, of the mill that were found by the original committee and, and uh, available to us to, to recreate the, the history of what's going on. So we, uh, our intention was uh, for an operating mill, um, but we also wanted to have it, uh, uh, bring it back so it's uh, 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 wonderful to look at and listen to and, and, and be around. Um, so originally they had uh, uh, wood water wheels on, on the mills way back when, because that's all they had was woods and, and trees. Uh, they, uh, and then they uh, modernized to a turbine, which is a water wheel on its side. If you can picture the water wheel here on its side, it spins like that. So we are fortunate to have both at this mill. Uh, we have the wood water wheel and we have the, uh, the turbine, which the original committee rebuilt. Uh, that turbine is our next project. Uh, we need to get a, uh, a 50, pound, 50 pounds of potatoes in a 20 pound sack. Uh, this turbine is much bigger now that it has been rebuilt and we need to find a way to get it down in below in the, in the, in the race in order for the, uh, uh, to, to spin to turn the, uh, the stones. The, the water wheel on the outside um, we felt was the, the best first addition to, the, to this um, because it would, uh, what would do is be able to uh, produce electricity at the mill uh, to operate the uh, lights for the American flag, security lights, and then uh, possibly some, uh, well, we've been using mostly hand tools uh, up to this point, probably will uh, for the future, but uh, the uh, we are looking to, if anyone knows anybody for, from NSTAR, uh, oh, as we're going through here, this is the back uh, um, stadium that was built. Uh, Walpole uh, donated that, um, those stones from an old railroad bridge, the Walpole DPW. Um, the fencing is all from uh, uh, Walpole Woodworkers. Uh, I asked them for old beat up fencing and they thought it was nuts, but um, so we were able to uh, bring in a lot of uh, still high quality cedar fence, uh, but that, that looks 300 years old. Um, as you can see, Tree Tech uh, donated their, their time and their, their, their crane to, uh, to put the water wheel in place. We're very lucky to have them as a neighbor uh, because this guy, this crane operator, uh, could probably thread a needle with this with this wheel the way he was the way he was able to uh, uh, bend it around the trees, bring it over the mill, and then drop it in on on the side. Um, here you see that the, the so the the wheel was built uh, down in Georgia uh, uh, by a gentleman by the name of Spencer, and he uh, was able to bring it up to us and and help us uh, set it in place and and. Uh, and, and get it rolling. How do you get water to a wheel when you can't, can't dig? You can't do any, any, any kind of reconstruction. The dam has to stay intact. It, it can't be, we can't be digging in it. Uh, it's holding back a tremendous amount of pressure. As you see, they're putting on the bearings. Th those are new bearings as opposed to this old bearing. Um, uh, and they're lining it up and, and securing the wheel. So uh, I came up with the idea of uh, suctioning water over the dam. So we have, uh, we have big, big uh, hoses that we, uh, we placed over the dam and then buried on top of that and created a suction uh, 
from the from over the uh, over the over the dam to the to the wheel. Um, because of that, we could not have an overshot water wheel because the, the suction only allowed us to go to mid-level on the wheel. Um, but this actually is, this wheel is more original uh, than an overshot wheel. Uh, the, the original wheels were all set up as breast shot wheels. They, they, they hit in the, in the middle and they spun backwards like that so they were able to use the stream underneath as well as the water hitting it there. Uh, efficiency was mediocre but there was plenty of power there. Um, uh, don't, you'll see donations. Uh, the, the wheels from Barbara Cronin. Um, uh, the pond is uh, now, if, if you like fishing, uh, this will make the record books pretty soon. Uh, we were able to turn out uh, eight pound bass this spring and a couple six pound bass uh, this fall. Uh, so the fishermen, you'll, if you drive past the mill, you'll see a lot of people fishing. Uh, there's a reason uh, that the pond has come back to life. Uh, this is the overflow for the, uh, for the grist mill on the side. Um, and that, 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 there's nice waterfalls on the side. So I uh, encourage everyone to pull into the grist mill. Now there's a turnaround. If you, go, if you pass the front of the grist mill and go up into the woods, you can actually do a loop, so you can, you can be facing back and pull out onto 27 uh, safely. Um, but I encourage everyone to walk down behind the mill. Uh, there's so much you can't see from the, the front. Uh, so the, uh, originally the, uh, the farmers would come in uh, to the mill uh, with their horse and, carriage, horse and uh, carriages and bring their product uh, to the front door. And then they would drive the horse and wagon down below, around back behind the mill, and uh, collect their flour, or barley, or et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I want to thank uh, Medfield TV for, uh, for doing the, the filming of the installation of the, uh, installation of the mill. Um, people to thank. Um, so, as we're going along, different people with different backgrounds started popping up. And I'm not sure if everyone's aware of the, uh, of the expertise we have in Medfield, but it's very broad and very, uh, 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 um, well, it's just unbelievable. So, uh, and, and Crowett got involved. Uh, and uh, as part of the committee, she, she and I were, were slugging it out there in the beginning, trying to figure out what we're going to do, how we're going get it, to get it done. And doesn't her brother um, have engineering background? And so he did all the, the, the drawings for the wheel, all the schematics for the wheel. Um, that was taken. Then, then uh, Spencer Boyd took that and figured out the head of water that was coming over that we were able to produce. <laughs> Uh, place the buckets correctly at a correct angle for the wheel, cor correct um, for uh, a breast shot wheel, and to get the maximum uh, uh, torque out of, the, out of the wheel and speed out of the wheel. Uh, uh, so people jumping in, uh, 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 Bob Piersack and his family from Northern Plumbing, uh, Needham, Garden, Needham Garden Center, uh, Garrett and his wife Marcy, uh, Tree Tech of Walpole, Hurley Testa of Medfield, um, uh, Jerry uh, Ionelli, <laughs> uh, Anne's, Anne's brother for the for the uh, uh, for the drawings and 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 help and wisdom, uh, Walpole Woodworkers, uh, Walpole Ponds. Uh, those folks we were skating, doing a lot of skating down there last winter. They had rebuilt the uh, the skate. Um, uh, the original skate hut um, in, in Walpole. And so those folks came up to help us clean out the property and because uh, we'd helped them with that pond, they came up and returned the favor uh, for us. Um, the, the Thompsons, Mike and Tanya, um, uh, the Bethany family, uh, my wife Sharon, uh, Medfield property, uh, and uh, excuse me, uh, 20, uh, Century 21 Commonwealth. <clears throat> excuse me, was, uh, was also instrumental in helping uh, with encouraging us. Um, so uh, 
how did things still come about? Uh, a neighbor was having a walk uh, redone, um, uh, Bill and Jill Fredrickson, uh, and they were being charged $100 to have the bricks hauled away. Uh, I said, I'll take them. Uh, so piled a bunch of bricks down at the mill, and sure doesn't uh, Rick Ebbs, a, a professional floor guy, say, hey, I'll lay them out for you. So we have some nice brick uh, walkways around the mill now. Uh, I don't want to say it's ADA compliant, but it's pretty close. Um, you, it, we have, a, we have a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a sloping walk to get down back, and uh, you can now go right up, right up front uh, with a uh, newly rebuilt deck uh, that the, uh, um, the DPW uh, and, and uh, it really helped us out. Uh, we're, the, the, the front deck was all rotted. It was a piece of plywood put over the sluiceway. It was actually close to dangerous. Um, I called uh, DPW. Bobby Kennedy said, uh, we'll see what we can do. And by that, he meant, I'll take care of it, and uh, we'll, we'll, we won't have a problem with it. And uh, a week later, uh, they had sent out some, uh, some uh, oak uh, trees that, were, that they had put behind the, the, the DPW. Uh, they sent them out to a mill, and they cut three-inch planks uh, out of them. And so we have a three-inch thick decking uh, in front of the mill. They also made uh, boards for the sluiceway to uh, prevent any, any washouts. Uh, and when they went to put in that, that new decking, uh, they rebuilt the, uh, the, the head or the, 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 uh, uh, the sluiceway uh, in front of the mill. So it's just been uh, a community effort. To put, to put this all together and to uh, get it to where it is. Um, where are we going with it? Um, we, it's, uh, we want a little bit of museum. We want a little bit of education. Um, we really want uh, uh, green energy. You hear that, but we'll have the, uh, the, uh, probably the only 300-year-old uh, um, uh, hydroelectric plant in the United States. <laughs> so old is new, new is old. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the Yankees uh, of years gone by wasted nothing. They took nothing for granted, and they lived off the land, and that's what they, they were given. So we're fortunate enough to uh, uh, take over something that we're now trying to return to. Me, you mean water can make electricity to power this, power that? Yes, it can. It's extremely powerful. If you felt the, uh, the suction and the, and the water coming out of these pipes, you'd be amazed. Uh, it's three inch, three inch pipes, and the water uh, comes just gushing out. It's a, a, a tremendous amount of power. Um, public space and recreation. Um, I, I, again, I can't encourage people enough to stop by the mill, pull in. Um, uh, it's yours. You own it. Uh, and uh, you walk around back. Uh, you can walk up to the beach. There's an old, uh, old town beach where they originally, uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, yeah, the swim pond. That's the original swim pond at the mill. Uh, and if you go up the hill into the woods and go down the, the backside, you'll see uh, the, uh, the sandy, uh, the beach that, uh, that was. We, we have been uh, rebuilding that as well, trying to uh, make it accessible and uh, uh, the fish, the, the, uh, the wildlife have responded uh, unbelievably. Um, as I said, the, the bass um, have come back. Uh, we expect that we're going to put trout in the, in the uh, down uh, in the, uh, the tail race um, next spring. We'll see how that goes. Uh, they need a, a quite a bit of a flow of water, but uh, we think we have that. Um, uh, and mostly uh, public space. If, if you have an opportunity to stop in there, it's a great place to hear running water, to hear, to hear uh, the, the, I hate to say it like this, but the birds chirping and, the, and, the, and, and, uh, and enjoy the natural beauty that Medfield has to offer. Um, the pond is not a real pond. It's a holding facility for the mill. Uh, there aren't any real ponds in Medfield. Uh, all ponds that are in Medfield were, were dammed up to make uh, for mill use and for origi the original settlers. 
The original settlers had a lot of uh, foresight uh, in what they were doing, but they also uh, fooled with our historic uh, uh, recollection. So if a barn fell down next door, uh, those boards would not go to waste. They used them on, on a building like the mill. So we have a lot of additions, a lot of uh, add-ons uh, to, to the original mill. We're trying to figure out, get to the original mill, but they've been, uh, the, the old Yankees, uh, again, when they were reusing everything, uh, added on, added on, added on. Made it more modern, more modern, more modern, and uh, eventually got to the point where it, they were, uh, they used it for, a, a, it wasn't a sawmill, it was a, uh, for cutting logs. Um, and that dro drove the, uh, that drove the, the water drove the saws. And then when that came out, out, of, out of favor, uh, the mill was left to sit. Fortunately for us, people of Medfield had the, um, enough foresight to purchase the property. It was probably a lot of money back then. They also had the, the foresight, the original committee, why I'm not begging you for money tonight, is because the original committee set up a, a nickel deposit at the transfer station. When you, in the, the old transfer station, you used to put the glass bottles in a, in a, in a can, and uh, uh, the can, you know, cans, glass bottles, and then there was a returnable bin. Well, that returnable bin for the nickel returnables was split three ways, uh, and one of, the, one of the splits went into a fund for the gristmill. Uh, when I was, when I, the project was, when I took on the project, I was told there was uh, $1,500 in the account for uh, the grist mill that the town had been, just had in, in the account. Uh, when I went in to find out, the accountant was laughing pretty hard. And I said, why? And she said, well, you're, you're lowballing it. And I said, okay, $3,000. And she laughed even harder. And she said, think compound interest, think 20 years. Of, of, of nickels, and uh, so $23,000 later, um, the, the, uh, the contribution was made by everyone in Medfield who threw, for a nickel, uh, we were able to uh, accomplish a wheel. Uh, we'll be able to accomplish uh, setting it up as a grinding uh, operation again. Uh, we'll be able to accomplish, uh, uh, I think, a lot of things for the town, but mostly to uh, turn this into a, a a, a jewel in the crown. So I, I don't know, Garrett, if we have. Um, so this is the wheel operating. Um, and then, uh, do you want to? So uh, two other folks from uh, from Medfield uh, were uh, have a bringing us into the 21st century. Uh, a drone with a camera on it, and we're able to do a flyover. Of the of the mill. Do you have a? I unplug that one. Uh, so we have some aerial shots uh, of the of the mill. Um, a lot of discussions uh, about the history of the mill, how old is it, and so forth. Uh, it's still uh, up in the air. Uh, with the advent of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, malting house. It puts a new dimension on it. Um, a lot of things that are left out of the history books are that uh, uh, the original settlers uh, made a lot of beer, uh, a lot of beer. It was uh, safe to drink. Um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get uh, Dejardia or, or any other type of uh, diseases on it because it was distilled. Um, and so there was a lot of uh, uh, barley and malt, uh, or uh, uh, barley being malted and, and, and so forth, uh, hops being malted. Uh, there was some crushing going on at the mill. Uh, you wouldn't have a malt house without a mill. You wouldn't have a mill without a dam. You wouldn't have a dam. It, 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 it all came around. So uh, we have dated back the malt house uh, um, early 1700s. Richard and I are still discussing the, uh, all, the, all the angles on it. But uh, you wouldn't have a malt house below the, mill, uh, below the dam unless you built the dam first. Uh, you wouldn't have a dam unless you were intending to put a mill on it. So it's, it's predating. Uh, uh, we, are, we are finding out, we're, we're, our feeling is that the mill is a lot older than, than uh, people had originally uh, uh, felt. 
Um, here are some aerial shots. Here's Route 27 on the, on the right-hand side. And uh, this is a, a, a new modern edition, 18, um, 18, I think 30, what's that? 89. 1889. So that's brand new. Uh, this is the original part of the mill here. Um, and uh, this, the, the addition was built. This, this is where, be, where the museum will be. Uh, this is where the, uh, the, the stones are inside. Um, the water flows underneath this deck into the mill and into a, a waterfall right now. Um, this was all rebuilt. This is where the water comes in from the pond. And uh, through, some, through some sluiceway boards here, it, it flows through under, underneath and, and the culvert uh, to the, uh, eventually to the uh, turbine underneath the mill and will turn the, turn the stones. Um, big plans. Um, I am, uh, nobody involved with this project is, uh, has been a mill right or knows anything about mills. Uh, we're, we're educating ourselves. Um, I'm in the restaurant business. Uh, uh, Garrett owns a garden center, uh, you, you name it. It's every, every walk of life that we come from. But the expertise everyone brings in um, completes uh, as, a, as a team, uh, makes it all possible. So with that, uh, I want to thank you. Um, come by, see the mill, and I'll take a couple questions please, if you like. Please acknowledge the fact that I go by uh, on 27 and look at it. I, I used to see Barbara on the way. Yes. Quite a bit of time. Yes. Barbara, Barbara um, was the driving force, I think, behind the committee. Uh, we met with Barbara, and she was able to turn over quite a few things to us. And the, the notes that she kept, kept were meticulous. The, uh, and with those, we've been able to reconstruct how the original mill was built. Um, uh, Barbara was, uh, as I said, was uh, laid all the bricks for the foundation of the building. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, we have some photos in back of the uh, original committee uh, that I'd like you to look at because they, they, as I said, did the yeoman's uh, work on this, on this mill. Uh, if it weren't for that committee, uh, we wouldn't be, we'd be, if it weren't for that committee, we would be stand, standing looking at uh, uh, what was a building, but it was wiped out by the pond because the pond just took it all with it. Um, and that, uh, the original photos will show you how, well, uh, I'll give you an example. The culvert on 27, the old culvert was made of wood um, and it came around this way in the mill. And so the, it was the overflow. So when they weren't operating the mill, the water would flow uh, through this wood culvert over this way. Um, uh, in, uh, I think, 1980, uh, uh, quote me wrong here, but in the 80s, uh, that wooden culvert collapsed and took 27 with it. So 27 was shut down for, for quite a while uh, because that's how much that water on that pond was able to, how much destruction it was able to wield uh, in, in one night. Of what a, year was that again, sir? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have to uh, re-reference my, uh, but it was, uh, um, uh, let me see, uh, Ken Feeney's first year. I think it was the first week on the job. <laughs> Somebody That's called him and said, education. yeah, <laughs> guess, guess what? Baptism by fire, Ken, uh, 27 is, is, is gone. Uh, and so we're going to have to, so the, uh, the, uh, again, the original committee has given us uh, a lot to work with, and we're, we're uh, really appreciative for that. Who was on the original? Besides Mike and Barbara. Um, Ann? I'm sorry, Ah, Heidi. Uh, the original committee uh, makeup? Paul Nyrick was one of the original committee members. Um, let's see, uh, Jeff Hoffman, Jeff Hoffman, Jeff Hoffman, Jeff Hoffman, We'll get that for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I believe there are 12 original members. Uh, uh, I was uh, Barbara Layton and Mike Cronin were the only two that were live when I, when I took.
took on the project. Uh, Mike passed uh, um, last winter, and so uh, 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 Barbara, his wife, has been a tremendous supporter of the whole project uh, and donated a lot of, uh, uh, she's re recently sold her house and donated a lot of uh, items from, from the house, uh, uh, old carriages, uh, um, you name it. Mike uh, was a collector of uh, antiquities and, and so uh, he, he really gave us a good start on the uh, on the, uh, 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 the, the part of it that's going to be the museum. Good. Hold on. This question may not be for you. Yeah. However, uh, why can't I swim in, in Key Street Pond again? Um, act actually, you can. I can? Yes. Uh, the police don't really care for it, uh, there's, some, there's some, uh, a couple girls. On, the question was, why can't I swim in Kingsbury Pond? Um, the, the, uh, so after years of neglect, the pond wants to turn back into a swamp. So the leaves and the, and the weeds, they die, they fall on the bottom, and they make a very flat, muddy bottom. And over the years, the mud gets very deep, maybe four or five feet deep. Uh, and, and the more the, the, the sediment lays on the bottom and isn't disturbed, that the, the shallower the pond gets, the faster the weeds grow, and the more the process speeds up. So by using the pond, you're stomping down the bottom in the mud, and you're, you're keeping the bottom down where it should be, uh, and now you have increased volume of water, uh, you have uh, less weeds, um, it's so, by, by people swimming in it, it actually helps our cause a great deal. Uh, <laughs> not, not to, not to, <laughs> don't, don't tell the chief I said that. No, uh, so uh, a, couple, uh, a couple of the neighbors swim in the pond. Uh, they take canoes out and jump in the, jump in the middle of the pond, swim. It's, uh, uh, I boated, boated in the pond. I have a rowing shell. Uh, that I took out there, and uh, so uh, because of my uh, abilities as a rower, uh, I was able to swim in the pond as well. Um, so uh, the water's extremely clean. It's very fresh. It's spring-fed. Uh, there's a path that, wa that goes around the pond uh, that's three-quarters completed. On the other side of the pond, down by the, uh, down by the church, there is, uh, it's kind of swampy. That's where the water comes in, but there's a beautiful stream coming into the pond up that, up that end as well. Great. Um, so what's happening now is people are, are uh, using the pond, so there's more activity in the pond, there's more settling of, of the mud on the bottom, and it's making it more appealing to walk in and actually swim. So it, the, the reason it, it, I think it faded as a, as a great swimming hole is uh, non-use, and uh, and maybe the the uh, the uh, Hinkley swim pond and so forth drew people other other places. So come down for a swim, yeah. <laughs> There's some pictures in the notebook that show a cob grinder. What yes. grip was that? Um, uh, There's pictures that show a cob grinder in the mill. Uh, it's basically a a big uh, meat grinder. But it's huge. The teeth are that big on it, and it's the, the whole machine is yay big. Uh, so the farmers, uh, when they brought in their corn, uh, would have it uh, they, they take it off the off the uh, husket and take it off the cob, and they bring in the cobs to throw into the grinder uh, for uh, a meal for their animals. Um, they'd also uh, use it as a bone grinder. Uh, so they take their animal again. Old Yankees did not waste one thing. Uh, I, I think they even used the squeal of the pig uh, when it was done. Uh, so they take the bones and they put it in this, this grinder, uh, and bone meal is a fantastic starter for, uh, for the crops for the next season. Handful of bone meal, a, a, a seed, and you're off and running. Uh, that was also operated uh, down below, uh, big, big leather belts. Uh, so they have big wheels down below in, in the underside of the mill, and, and uh, leather straps were used from, the, uh, from the, the, the shaft, and they would throw the, throw the leather shaft over, the, over this big wheel with a shaft on its own that goes upstairs to the bone, the bone grinder or the, uh, the uh, cob grinder. 
we hope to get that machine going as well. <laughs> that should be something else. Can I ask you a question, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, my father did some masonry work on the Christmas. Yes. Back in, like, I'm going to say, 1954. Did some masonry work in 54, yeah. Yeah, he, I mean, I, Great. I know it was built before then, but. Yeah. Um, Is there anybody can check out any archives on that? Yeah, um, we, have, uh, we have quite a few archives right back here. You can look for your, your, your father's picture may even be in there. Uh, again, John okay, again, uh, Barbara uh, Layton took uh, meticulous notes. And, and so anyone who contributed uh, is probably in, uh, in the history and the, the notes we have. Uh, again, part of the museum is going to be that, the history of the original uh, committee. And, and we have uh, plenty to work with, uh, pictures, uh, activities, things that, things that they, they did. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I want to encourage you to come by. Come by the mill. We, we eventually will uh, try to keep it open on Sundays. Um, and so everyone can, can see inside the mill, see the progress. Uh, wear dirty clothes. This is not how I dress when I work at the mill. Uh, I'm usually in waders and, and muddy, uh, muddy shirt. Uh, so uh, come by if you can contribute in any way. We'd love to have you, whether it's, it's uh, uh, your knowledge or uh, your, your, your pocketbook or, your, or, or items that you think that uh, Medfield, uh, Medfield folks or, or visitors would find interesting. Um, Kurt Schilling is having a yard sale uh, this Saturday. Uh, I think we're going to see if I, I, I'll, be, uh, uh, I, I'll be unavailable, but uh, we're going to see if we can open up the mill at that time to uh, show uh, visitors from out of town, because I'm sure there'll be quite a few, that Medfield uh, has really something special to offer. Great. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Provided by Medfield.tv. Access to our community.